All right, let's get going. Uh, seems like we have a rather sparse turnout today. Uh, I'm hoping that's because the, whoever is not here is attending it, attending that event that's ha happening that I talked about earlier. Uh, if not, well, I don't know. Um, I, re I really don't have any announcements of any kind today, other than just a reminder that there's a homework out there and there's no uh, nothing new that I want to add to that. Um, so are there any, any, is there anything that you, any of you want to get out of the way before we move into technical stuff? Yes. Um, can you explain the online framework, the singletons, like what exactly it means? Is, is it like, are the singletons just where the whole array is all zero for one element or is it just kind of big one? Um, I have to, does anyone have a quote, the question? I have to read it, uh, to make sure that I got it right. Aman, do you have a copy of the question or used to be the case that uh, at least one student used to print out the questions uh, way back in, in you know when we still did things on paper uh, so I don't really have the exact word or the question uh, yeah could you read it Okay, so let's just to let me pull up an empty page so that I can. So a singleton uh, is a function. Uh, is it something like f z of x? Something like that, right? Is, uh, yeah, f z. Yeah, it's a function that. Can you repeat that? It's true only when. It's true only when. Uh, okay, so really, this is saying that it's one if x equals z and zero. Yeah. This is the singleton function. Um, I could give an example that kind of illustrates this a bit more. Unfortunately, I'm afraid that if I give an example, I'll just give you the answer. Uh, so what I encourage you to do is uh, consider the case where the inputs are two dimensional and create a singleton function for some z. Create all singleton functions. See how many you have. Now, can you extrapolate that argument to beyond two dimensions? That's a good sort of an attack strategy. In general, a reasonable attack strategy for a lot of these questions is think of a small version of the problem, maybe one or two or three dimensional cases. See what that problem looks like. Construct an example. Um, typically, the answer just comes out. That's the nature of most of these homework questions. Uh, unless, of course, there are the homework question itself is in one or two dimensions, in which case it's going to be a little harder. Um, like the some of these VC dimension type questions where you have to do a bit more work. But uh, for this question, I encourage you to just construct an example in one or two dimensions, in two dimensions. In fact, you know what? Uh, proceed in the following way. First, consider the case when the inputs are one dimensional. Then consider the case when the inputs are two dimensional. See what happens. And in that, go, in going from one to two dimensions and maybe to three, you might notice a pattern. And it's not enough to, uh, a valid a pattern is not a valid proof. Then you have to actually write a proof in a formal way saying that um, in the dimensions, this is what happens. And you know you need to prove it, but the pattern will give you an idea for how this works. All right? Other questions? Yeah. The first question says, um, "There are n pixels in a day, and just the point where I can take those one pixel in the boxes. How are the boxes groups?" Yeah. So it's sort of confusing. So I was thinking hypothesis, hypotheses of functions. Yeah. And no. then the hypothesis of images. Right, right, right. So the, this actually, when I first read it, it confused me as well. So uh, even though I have seen the variants of this kind of a question many times. So let me see if I can explain this. The task is your, the, the goal is to recognize an image, right? So you want to know whether or not recognize an image, whether an image is valid or invalid or something like that. So there is one image that's valid and other things that are invalid. 
which means that every collection of image. So what's an image? An image is a collection of pixels. So you have a collection of pixels. One particular collection of pixels is valid. Other collections of pixels are invalid. So every image is a hypothesis because every image is defines that function that's valid. Does that make sense? Possibly, I I I am not commenting on that, <laughs> but uh, yes, basically. So every image corresponds to a function. Yeah. Um, so the concept of structure. Uh huh. Are you saying that you need more than one? No, no, no. So actually, this question came up in office hours also. So the uh, I, I, what I'm actually intending is it's literally just two circles let's see if i can draw a circle oh. okay um, and this area is positive and this is negative that's it so it's it's this ring that uh, so i think the next sentence in that question says the ring uh, inside the ring is positive or something like that so you have this, uh, you have two circles that are concentric and the region in between them is positive everywhere else is negative. Yeah, this question came up in office hours also and I wanted to make a clarification. Thanks for bringing it up. Other questions? So uh, in the past, I've noticed um, something interesting about this particular homework. You know, the, uh, it, the learning theory homework tends to be for some students the most difficult homework of the class and for some other students it tends to be the most fun homework of the class and it uh, really depends on how much you like math and how much you like solving puzzles <laughs> um, i encourage you to think of all the questions in this homework as this is just a collection of puzzles don't kind of worry about uh, when you brand it as math people get worried uh, instead, think of it as well, there are seven or something number of puzzles that you need to solve for this homework. So happens that those puzzles are written like math, but that's just you know coincidence. I would encourage you to approach all the VC dimension question like they're puzzles to begin with. And then, of course, you can't just say, oh, I put this puzzle together and that's my answer. No, you need to give a formal proof. Uh, but at least when you're trying to come up with the idea for it, think of it as a puzzle. Other questions, comments, any thoughts? Yes. Um, when I asked the board about like bounding the simple complexity, are you allowed to assume that the linear is consistent? Yes, I, I, you are allowed to make that assumption, but make it explicitly in the in your uh, report. Whatever assumption you make, make it explicit in the report. Other questions? As, as we go along, I will stop giving more and more details and you might have to make assumptions to kind of, uh, uh, so, so, and your answers will be graded based on your assumptions because you know that's how things work in real life. Uh, you, you know, you, you, uh, when you're applying machine learning, you're not told this data comes from, was generated by this model or this data is linearly separable. You just have to make an assumption. And so that's, we're trying to simulate a bit of that in the class. Other comments? Any anything else you want to talk about? Homework? If not, let's continue where we were. Talking about boosting and ensembles. And my hope is to finish that lecture today. And uh, hopefully we'll are there is there anything on Zoom? No. Okay. So my hope is to finish this uh, unit on uh, boosting and ensembles. And if time permits, maybe I'm not entirely convinced that I will, but there's a reasonable chance I might start the lecture on uh, uh, support vector machines after that. So in the last lecture, we were talking, uh, uh, we, we, will, we looked at this idea of uh, boosting. Uh, and the question that it was designed to answer or uh, the question that uh, was framed uh, really came from this notion of uh, 
strong and weak path algorithm. A strong path algorithm is one that uh, for any distribution over the example, for any epsilon and any delta, it will find a classifier whose error is less than epsilon with probability one minus delta. And after the class, uh, I think there was a little bit of a discussion on what this epsilon and delta, what it means. Uh, what does it mean for any error uh, epsilon? So imagine I'm going to draw a number line. This is 0 to 1. And let's say um, our data points, uh, the, the labels are uniformly distributed, meaning there are two labels and it's uniform. That means that uh, um, any reasonable classifier, if it just crosses a prime or if it just predicts label 0 or label 1 all the time, it's going to get half of them right. So no classifier worth its salt should have an error that is more than half. Right? So most, an error more than half means it's actually worse than random guessing. Um, so let's pretend that we don't have to worry about that ever. And now the, the strong pack algorithm says, you give me a value of epsilon. So something, so the strong pack algorithm says, you give me a value of epsilon. Let's say epsilon is here. And with probability one minus delta, the learning algorithm will produce a classifier whose error is somewhere in that range. You don't like that epsilon, maybe you want a smaller error, then you give me an epsilon somewhere here, and with probability one minus delta, it'll produce a classifier whose error is in that range. And you might say, this seems like magic. It's always like I can make epsilon arbitrarily, arbitrarily small, of course there's a catch. As epsilon gets smaller, we know that the number of examples needed goes up. That's the price you pay. So if you if you demand a smaller error, then the number of uh, examples that that algorithm is going to demand in exchange is small. But the important point is there is no uh, limit on how low that epsilon can be. That epsilon can be arbitrarily small. On the other hand, a weak pack algorithm what it does is, let's use a different color here, or let's draw the same thing again. What a weak pack algorithm would do is, there is some number that's called delta. Delta is this gap here. Oh, sorry, not delta, gamma. Gamma is that gap there. So gamma is just a number, some number that's very, very close to zero. And what the uh, weak path algorithm says is that uh, that algorithm will not give you an, uh, a classifier whose error is less than epsilon for arbitrarily small epsilon. You're allowed to pick an epsilon only in this range between half and half minus gamma. Which means, you know, if gamma is a really small number, this classifier that this, uh, the learner produces will have an error that's slightly less than half. But it cannot be much less than half because gamma is uh, uh, a small number. So, in just to make the contrast very clear, I'm not in the strong pack case. I'm allowed to pick an epsilon anywhere in this range. In the weak pack case, I'm allowed to pick an epsilon only in this range, very close to half. Okay, so that's the difference between a strong and a weak pack algorithm. Now, we don't know if weak pack algorithms exist. We don't know if strong pack algorithms exist, but we do know that strong pack algorithms exist. Now, the question that uh, Kearns and Valiant asked was, suppose I give you, a, suppose there is a concept class for which I'm able to give you an algorithm for, uh, that has a weak uh, pack algorithm, uh, that, that has weak pack guarantee. What that means is for that concept class, no matter which concept is the true function, um, the there is this learner that will produce a classifier whose error is slightly less than half. Not too much less than half, but slightly less than half. It's ever so slightly better than chance is all there is. The question that they asked was, does this, any? can we say anything about strong learnability of that particular concept class? So does weak learnability imply strong learnability? Okay, this was the question that, uh, they asked, and uh, the answer was uh, this was uh, the, the answer took the form of you can prove this answer in a few different ways. 
one of them, one, one style of a proof might have been uh, this sort of a, a proof of existence. There, is, if this concept class or any concept class that's weakly path learnable, there will there exists a strong path algorithm. You know, it's just saying that there exists an algorithm. I don't know what that algorithm is. There exists one. Another style of proof is a constructive proof. I say, if you have a weak pack algorithm, here is an algorithm that will use your weak pack algorithm as a subroutine, and it has strong guarantees. So it's a constructive proof. The first style of proof is just proof of existence. I don't know what the algorithm is. There exists something. The other one says, not only can I prove that uh, you know there is an algorithm, here is the algorithm that will do the job for you. Here is the strong pack algorithm. And boosting, uh, the boosting question was answered in the latter way. The answer took the form of an algorithm called add a boost, which is a constructive proof of a strong, which is an, which it turns out uses the weak learner as a subroutine to, uh, and itself is a strong pack learner. This is, uh, give or take a, you know, some detail. This is roughly where we left things at the end of the last lecture. Any questions about these uh, strong and pack learnability? If not, let's jump into the algorithm itself, add a boost. And uh, the plan is I'm going to give you, I'm going to first show an example uh, that kind of builds an intuition for what this add a boost algorithm will do. Then I'll work through the algorithm itself and give you some hints about why it works. I'm not going to go over the proof, but the proof is actually rather simple and it's on the website. I encourage you to go over it. Um, it's uh, Going to take a little bit more effort, uh, you know, time than we have to go through the proof. So, here's a small example. Let's say we have this two-dimensional data uh, of pluses and minuses, and our goal, as always, is to build a classifier that separates the plus from the minus. And suppose we have this weak learning algorithm whose hypothesis space consists of this axis parallel line. Two axis parallel. It has to pick a line, either a horizontal line or a vertical line, and uh, it has to put the line somewhere and say that one side is plus and the other side is minus. It the learning algorithm, the weak learner that uh, we are working with, can only choose. It has only two decisions: one, is the line horizontal or vertical, and two, where should the line be? Given a data set, it can do that. Okay. The other thing that Adaboost keeps track of along the way is something that I'll call importance for each example. In the beginning, in the Adaboost is a is an iterative algorithm. In the before the iteration starts, the first at the first step, all examples are equally important. And based on that, let's say the weak learner, and then you make a subroutine call to the weak learner. And let's say the weak learner picks. This particular classifier, H1. H1, it, it has decided that it's going to take the vertical line and put it right there. And let's say for some reason, H1 is the best classifier on this data set according to the weak learner. Now, of course, this classifier is not perfect. There are mistakes. In particular, there are 10 examples here, and out of those, three of them are misclassified, the three pluses. And so the error, we will call that epsilon 1. Epsilon 1 has a value 0.3, 3 out of 10. So far, so good? Okay. Now, uh, now comes the cool thing. What Adaboost does is, rather than saying, this round is over, by the way. So this, at this the round consists of, of finding the weak classifier and then computing the error of the classifier. There's one more step that we'll get to later, but these are this is roughly what it does, what there are. The next thing that it does is it says, you know, I have this, my current weak classifier, H1, made mistakes on those three examples. So I'm going to make them more important for the next round. I'm going to promote them for the next round, and I'm going to demote all the other ones which this classifier already got right. So the importance of the all the examples that were incorrectly predicted goes up. And the importance of all the examples that were incorrectly predicted goes down. 
So the, in general, I'm going to call, call these this importance of examples. I'm going to call that d sub t at the tth round. This is d sub t. D is a distribution. D is a uh, you can think of it as a distribution over these examples. Uh, every example has a number between zero and one, and all these uh, weights for assigned to examples add up to one. And uh, you should think about this d sub t as uh, uh, as a collection of weights that tells the learner how much should this learner care about each example in the next round. Here, there is an implicit assumption being made. My weak learner is not something that can just take a data set and produce a classifier. It can take a data set, but it also should be able to ingest these weights so that examples that have higher weights are treated as more important. Let's pretend that our weak learner can do that. We'll, for, we can reserve the discussion for how you should modify the algorithms you've seen uh, to account for that. We can you can think about that as we go along. So let's say that the weak learner knows how to uh, find the classifier such that the example such that it respects the importance of these examples. So now let's say based on this, it finds a new uh, uh, classifier. Once again, it has picked this vertical line, but this time it has moved the vertical line so that the examples that were marked as important are all correct. Blue means uh, uh, plus, I guess, and red means minus. Okay, so we have, uh, this is not H1, but let's say this is H2. H2 is a classifier that's learned on this data. It has made three mistakes, but I'm claiming that this H2 has an error, not three out of 10, but 0.21, a number that's less than three out of 10. And that's a bit counterintuitive. The reason for that is when computing the errors, when computing the uh, this error of the classifier, we will not assign an equal weight to each, each example. We are, instead of adding up every example once, we are going to add up the weights of those examples. So we are, uh, uh, so if each example xi, whether it is correct or not, uh, if it is incorrect, it, it adds d i to the error. So I'm assuming here that each of these have a weight of 0 0.07 uh, for reasons that I really don't know. If all of them have a weight of 0 0.07, I've made three such mistakes. So the total error is 0 0.21. Now, more generally, the error is defined in this way. Uh, and I don't want to go over this in too much detail, but you, because it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a technical thing, and you know, this, this is one of those things that you can work out offline, and it's a nice little uh, way to convince yourself that you understand this. But this is the definition of the error, where every uh, example, the, uh, where yi times h of xi is weighted by d. You add them all up, and there's some scaling to make sure that we get a number between zero and one. Uh, just to kind of give you a hint as to why this is a, a reasonable definition of the error, we should consider two cases, when y equals h of x and y is not equal to h of x. When y is equal to h of x, you get y times h of x is minus one. Because h is either a positive plus or minus, h is a classifier, right? And y, when these two are not equal, you get y times h of x is plus one. Okay, so you have that. And uh, you, what you're doing here is really you're adding up half minus half times sum over dt, and then you have plus one or minus one, whether this is a correct or error. And you have a bunch of these. Um, and it turns out that this expression is equivalent to saying you just add up all the examples where there, you have an error, you add up the weights. Um, I'm not going to prove it. I kind of already have taken you halfway through the proof in what I just did, but I want you to kind of uh, try to prove it uh, formally offline. Before we go ahead, questions about this. So let's just kind of recap what we've done. Learning proceeds in rounds. In each round, um, at any point in each round, every the examples have weights, which say how important is that example. Then the weak learner is called. 
the weak learner respects those weights and produces a classifier such that the examples that have higher weights are more likely to be correctly classified. So you get a weak, weak classifier. Then the weak classifier uh, is applied on the training set, importantly on the training set. And then all the training errors are counted. The training errors are all added up to produce this error for that round. And then there is a little bit of extra massaging that happens, which we will get to later, and that ends the round, and then we are ready to go to the next round. Oh, wait, no, there's an important step that happens before that. Before we go to the next round, the examples have to be reweighted. At the end of, you know, you've made, you've, we've discovered that examples have, some examples are correct and some examples are incorrect. The examples that are incorrect are promoted for the next round, and the examples that were correctly predicted are demoted so that they become less important. Any questions about what we have so far? And the example will go through another round of, we'll go through another work to another round of uh, Adaboos after that. Questions? If there are no questions, what I encourage is, as I'm walking through the next round, try to predict what I will say next. Be a chatbot or something like that. So, for the next round, uh, these three examples were incorrectly predicted. So, they have become more important. And the examples that were correctly predicted in both rounds actually became even less important from here to here. And these ones, these pluses also kind of shrunk a bit uh, because they were correctly predicted this time. So, the uh, what, the, the last step in this round of Adaboos is to reweight the examples so that the mistakes get promoted and the correctly predicted examples get demoted. So now we are back at the beginning. We have a set of weights for this round, which tells you how much should the weak learner care about each example. Importantly, the, the, all these weights add up to one, it's a distribution. And uh, the job of the weak learner now is to find a classifier such that it correctly predicts as many of these uh, uh, important examples as possible. So maybe it finds this time a horizontal line such that the minus the three minuses that were errors last time are correct are correctly predicted, and even these three pluses are correctly predicted. Okay. And this time, once again, we calculate the error. This time the error is 0.14. Why? Because there are three examples that are wrong. This one, this one, and this one. But look how small they are. They are extremely unimportant examples. So adding up their weights is going to give you a much smaller error. So the error, the definition of the error in Adaboos is it's a weighted error over the examples, the weight being the importance of these examples. So this time the error is 0.14. Um, once again, for reasons I can't really explain, it's 0.14, it's just a number. And we can keep going. Adaboost has this hyperparameter, which is the number of rounds that it needs to proceed. In the interest of time, I decided to stop with three rounds. So we have these three classifiers that we are collecting, H1, H2, and this new H3 here. We, have, we, we need to remember all the three classifiers we have collected. And the final classifier that Adaboost returns is none of these things but actually a combination of them. You have three classifiers, H1, H2, and H3. When a new example comes in, all the three weak classifiers are applied to them and they produce a label, plus or minus. Every weak classifier is assigned a weight, which we will talk about later. That's the last step that I did not mention in each round. Every weak classifier is assigned a weight, alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three. The predictions of the weak classifiers are weighted by the alphas. So you get a real number. And then you take the sign of that, and that is the final prediction of this combined model. What we have here is an ensemble. An ensemble is a classifier that uses as other classifiers as uh, you know subcomponents, have, have them have them all make their predictions, and then unifies their prediction somehow to construct a consensus. The way the consensus is done here is every weak classifier H1, H2, and H3 is given, uh, think of the alphas as a vote. Uh, H1 has a vote of alpha 1, H2 has a vote of alpha 2, H3 has a vote of alpha 3. 
its label uh, is weighted by alpha one or alpha two or alpha three as appropriate, so that we get a total, uh, um, you know, weighted uh, score, which then is uh, uh, thresholded at zero to get the label. That takes us to the end of uh, um, this sort of an intuitive exploration of Adaboost. Any questions so far? What we'll do next is then get into the details of this. Questions about what's going on here? Questions on Zoom, maybe? Yes. So, in fact, the final hypothesis, it turns out that the, the theorem will show can achieve arbitrarily low training error. And because we have the, um, the bound from training error to generalization, that means that it, 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 it also can be, a, it, it's a pattern, a strong pattern. And the, that's the theorem that accompanies this uh, thing. That's the theorem that I'll state, but not prove, but the proof is not particularly hard. There are a lot of moving parts in this algorithm. And there are a lot of what seems like arbitrary choices. Once I tell you how the error is computed, seem like this ugly expression. Uh, how the alphas are computed also seems rather arbitrary, but it turns out those choices are made so that the proof works. But uh, yeah, the, this particular hypothesis as the number of rounds increases can achieve an arbitrarily low training errors. Other questions? Yes. Yes. As long as it satisfies this property, uh, the the uh, what do you call it? The the desired criterion, namely that its error is always better than chance. The most common label. Well, what happens here is remember it's it's the mode on the data, but that's in the first round when all examples are equal. When the next time you call that learner, it's going to the mode will change because uh, the, it has to be the weighted uh, version of it. So it might guess a different uh, label. So eventually it will start guessing the other label. Um, and that's actually a cool thing to implement. You can try doing that on some toy problem and it will work. Yeah. Yes. You could. Uh, so there's nothing that prevents your weak learners from being anything. Uh, there is some trade off uh, uh, in practice. If your weak learners get too strong, then your combined model is a combination of all these weak learners, and it's going to have an extremely high weighted dimension, it turns out. And that will make it, uh, that will it, basically you can overfit. It's possible to overfit using this. All right, let me. Uh, so that's the first exploration of Adaboost where we. All we did was uh, go through an example. The next, we are going to go through the same algorithm, but this time uh, with word rather than picture. And this time I'm going to talk, give you flesh out some of these details. So the Adaboost algorithm uh, operates on a collection of training examples. We have M examples here, uh, X, I, and Y, I. X, I is, uh, is in some instant space. And the yi's are either minus one or plus one. So we have a binary classification problem. There is a hyperparameter, which is t, the number of rounds. Adaboost proceeds in rounds. At each step, there are really only two things that happen. First of all, a distribution is constructed d sub t for that particular round. And then the weak learner is caught. The weak learner produces a weak classifier, ht, or sometimes called the rule of thumb. In this, uh, in this in this literature, whose error is epsilon t. Now, this is not your standard definition of error where we just count the number of mistakes divided by the number of examples. This is the sum of all the weights on the mistakes. 
And you do this three times. You construct a distribution, then find a way uh, a weak classifier that has a low weighted error. You keep doing this three times. And after that, you have T weak classifiers. Finally, you combine all of them to construct this H final, which is the uh, the ensemble that calls all these weak classifiers on any new example. To actually flesh this out, I argue that all I need to show is how to construct this distribution at each round and how to construct this final output. This mid, this other step here, finding a weak hypothesis, is not my problem. It's basically any learning algorithm can apply that, provided it knows how to find a small uh, a classifier that has a small weighted error. I did not tell you how that works, but it turns out perceptron can be easily modified to do that. You can modify your decision tree learner to do that. And uh, at the end of this lecture, we can uh, uh, you know think about it. And at the end of the lecture, maybe we can discuss how that's done. For now, for to specify what Adaboost is, I need to show you how to construct this distribution after each round and how to combine all these weak classifiers to construct the final hypothesis. Okay, so let's talk about constructing this distribution. We have a collection of examples, M of them, and uh, at any step, at the teeth step, we have dt, which is a set of weights over these examples. So it's you can think of this as a vector of m elements, d1, d2, d3, till dm. Importantly, this is uh, turns out it's, it's a distribution, and that the reason that's important is for the proof to work. But just want to say this: at any step, you have this property. And these weights add up to one. So you can think of this as a sort of a distribution over these examples. The goal of uh, the reason we have these weights is the weak learner looks for hypotheses such that uh, examples whose d p of i is uh, uh, higher are emphasized more, and uh, the learner tries to make those examples correct in, it, uh, in the classifier that it produces. In the beginning, we know nothing. So all examples are equally weighted. In other words, D1 of i is simply the uniform distribution for all i, so it's 1 over m. We have m, m examples. Every example gets a weight of 1 over m. So that's easy. And then let's say we have, this process has uh, proceeded for t rounds. At, at the end of the t round, what we have is the current value of dt current distribution that was used. We've already called the new, uh, the, the, we've already called the weak learner. So we already have the weak uh, classifier that was learned, HT. And because we've had the weak classifier, we can compute the error, the weighted error of that particular classifier on the training data. So we have epsilon T as well. And the goal now is to construct D T plus one using these three things. We have DT, the current distribution over the examples, we have HT, the current classifier that was just learned, and epsilon T, which is the error of this classifier. What we would like for the next round is we want to find an uh, in the next round, uh, when we call the weak learner, we would like to find a hypothesis, a classifier that takes correct predictions on examples that this particular classifier got wrong. So essentially, we want to uh, we want to correct or uh, undo the mistakes of this classifier. So it's a natural thing to expect that we want some operation that increases the weights of the misclassified examples and decreases the weight of the correctly classified examples in this round. So far, so good. Any question? Okay. So turns out there's a sort of an easy uh, way of doing that. Uh, this is a multiplicative uh, promotion and demotion here, where let's consider only one example. We are sitting on an example, the ith example. For the ith example, we already have dt of i. If that example was correctly classified, then I'm going to multiply it with this expression e power minus alpha t. We'll talk about what alpha t is later. For now, just assume that it's a positive number. So we have e power minus alpha t. 
what happens if you multiply uh, what is e power a minus uh, a negative number? This is one over e power some positive number. E power of positive number is a number more than one. So this quantity is going to be less than one. So when this example is correctly classified, when yi equals h of xi, then dt of i is going to be multiplied with a number that is less than one. As a result, its weight goes down. Let's now consider the other case. When, when the example is incorrectly predicted, when yi is not equal to h of xi. In that case, I'm multiplying with e power plus alpha t. I still haven't told you what alpha t is. Just take it as a given that it's a positive number. E power, a positive number, is going to be a positive number. So I have this dt multiplied with e power a with a positive number. So it with a number more than one, sorry. Um, e power anything is always positive. So e power, a positive number, is a number more than one. So the weight for the ith example is the old weight times a number more than one. In other words, it gets upweighted or up weighted, yeah, promoted. There is a z term here, which we can worry about later. Um, the job of the z is to make sure that these things all add up to one, but that's a, a minor detail. Any questions about this mechanism without worrying about the z? Will alpha be what? No, in fact, alpha is alpha t, it turns out, is also the weight assigned to the uh, t hypothesis. It's a function of the error, it turns out. In fact, alpha t is, I can tell you, it is log of 1 minus epsilon t divided by epsilon t. But we'll get there later. We don't have to worry about it. Alpha won't be geometrically reducing. Do you have a question? Yes. We won't go to zero, but we are going to some very, very tiny number. Yeah, that's right. If in, in let's say you do this for ten dollars. And in every round, there is some example that was always correctly predicted. In each round, you will be hitting this side of the thing. No, not that side. This side of the thing, where you keep getting, the, its weight keeps getting multiplied by a number less than one. So it keeps getting smaller and smaller. And uh, uh, But we, we still have to normalize it so that the, uh, the weights add up to one. So that kind of compensates a little bit. But in general, examples that are always correctly predicted will get less and less and less important and practically go down to zero very quickly. And the, as a result, only the quote unquote difficult examples will be the uh, problem of the later round. And by difficult examples, I mean examples that repeatedly keep inducing an error. Okay. I'm going to combine these two things, this sort of multi-case dev thing into a single expression here. Instead of yi equals and yi not equals, I can just say yi times ht because y is a num yi is between minus one, is, is either minus one or one. H t of xi is also minus one or one, is also a number in either minus one or one. And correct means when you multiply them, the signs get, uh, uh, you know, the basically you get a positive number. Otherwise, you get a negative number. So I can just say e power uh, minus alpha times yi ht of xi. This is just like a syntactic uh, manipulation. There's nothing particularly fancy going on there. From, from here to here is just convenience. So just to kind of quickly, uh, revisit 
uh, what I just said. And a correctly promoted example, a correctly predicted example will get demoted because uh, alpha will be is a positive number, and as a result, this dt will be uh, multiplied with a number between zero and one. An incorrectly predicted example will be promoted because alpha is again uh, positive. As a result, its its dt will be multiplied with a number that's more than one. So that's uh, that's almost the entire story. There's still this question of how to compute z. Z is a normalized. Did you have a question? Z is a normalization constant. Uh, it ensures that um, all these things add up to one. Any thoughts on how you compute the z, given what we have on the screen so far? I would argue that all the information you need to compute z is available on screen. Um, someone who's not answered. Yes. What was the last thing you said? You pre compute all that and then? Uh, you put that in the denominator, but you need to add them over all examples. So, so here's, a, here's the way to think about it. Okay, I'm, I'm going to give you like a very lazy version of uh, an, a lazy illustration. Imagine that I give you three numbers 17. Um, no, let's not do these things. So, let's say I have three. Um, Let's say this is D1, this is D2, and this is D3. I need you to transform these numbers into something that such that their uh, sum becomes one. What would you do? So I compute three plus four plus three is 10. And so this goes to three tenths. This is four tenths. This is three tenths. Okay, it's the most obvious thing to do. Just add them up, and that's literally what it is. The normalization constant is computed in exactly the same way. First, you compute all of this stuff without the z. Then you get those numbers that are that can be arbitrarily uh, large or small, and normalize them by dividing by the sum for that round. So, I, I said this is an exercise, but really, d z sub t is the sum over i of d t of i times this is exactly the thing inside the circle, inside that kind of loop that I have drawn. There's nothing. Uh, particularly exciting about that. Uh, this is just the first thing that you might think of. It turns out that the choice of normalizing plays a bit of a critical role in the proof, but uh, it doesn't, it shouldn't really matter uh, from any implementation point of view. Okay, the only other thing that's left here is for me to tell you what are all these alphas. And uh, in Adaboost, the choice of alpha is fixed. It, 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 alpha t is a function of the error that is made in that round. Remember, this is a weighted error. Error epsilon t is, is the weighted error. It's the sum of all the weights on the mistakes. So, and we know that epsilon t is less than half because we have a weak learner, but it's still better than chance. We assume that the error, is the, the weak classifier is better than chance. So, Alpha t is simply defined to be half of log 1 minus epsilon divided by epsilon. Now, because epsilon t is less than half, 1 minus epsilon t is going to be more than epsilon t. Right? 1 minus epsilon t is going to be a number more than half. So you are dividing 
a number more than half by a number less than half. So this whole thing is going to be for the number that's more than one. If that number is more than one, log of that is going to be positive. As a result, alpha t is always positive. This makes sure that the rest of everything else that I said here, uh, you know, promotion and demotion and everything works out. This is again a choice made in this particular uh, algorithm. And this algorithm is a very tightly, it has a lot of very tightly coupled features. You know, the choice of alpha t is you don't get to choose the way it's arbitrary. It has to be this thing. The promotion and demotion can't be done by just adding something or something, uh, you know, uh, uh, adding a constant every time there's a mistake and subtracting a constant. It's not additive. It has to be done in this multiplicative way. Things have to be normalized this way. The reason everything is so tightly coupled is because by doing that, uh, uh, you know, your friend and Rob Shapir were able to prove that we have a strong algorithm. All these choices are necessary to make the proof work. This is what I mentioned earlier when I said there are a lot of what seem like arbitrary choices, but it turns out those choices tend to make a difference for the proof to work. Okay, it this alpha is used in two places. It's used for this promotion slash demotion business. And at the end, when the final classifier is constructed, it's also the, the same alpha serves as the vote that this particular classifier gets in the final decision. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 In zero here and yeah, so you get a what do you get then? Let's so the question. This is a good uh, sort of an exploration. Let's say that you found a classifier that got an error of zero. What happens then? No, let's think this through. What happens? Let's mechanically go through this process. You have an infinity. What is log of infinity? Log of infinity is not negative infinity. Sorry? So correct examples get downweighted to zero. And all the incorrect examples, there are none of them. So you basically get a uniform distribution on the examples again. But more importantly, let's talk about what happens to alpha. That would be the only classifier that matters. So alpha t becomes infinity because epsilon t is zero, that means log of one over zero is infinite. So that becomes the only classifier whose vote, whose voice gets heard in the final decision, which seems reasonable, right? But that's a good, uh, that's a good edge case to think about because this thing doesn't fail there. Okay, so what we have, what have we seen so far? Uh, in this uh, add a boost algorithm, I said in order to kind of tell you what the, how this algorithm works, I need to show you how to construct a distribution on these examples. And I just went through this uh, uh, sort of list of intricate steps, seemingly intricate steps that, uh, that does that. I would encourage you to kind of revisit that and maybe in a future homework, I might even have you work through that manually because it's worth actually working through it on paper to understand how it, you know, understand the mechanics of it. The next thing here is uh, I need to construct the final hypothesis. I already told you how, but for the sake of completion, uh, let's uh, go through this thing. So let's say we've done this, uh, uh, we've, we've run this thing for T rounds. We have at our hand T weak classifiers, H1, H2 till H, T, and each weak classifier is associated with an alpha T, alpha 1, alpha 2, till alpha capital T. Now, every weak classifier is also a classifier. It takes an example and produces a label. It takes an X and produces either a minus 1 or a 1. The final hypothesis is simply the weighted sum of all these decisions and a, 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 a threshold applied to that. So every alpha sub t gets to, you know, when a new example comes in, 
every alpha sub t is called as a uh, subroutine and its label is uh, all these labels are collected every label is multiplied by the sorry, every h sub t is called and all the labels are collected and then all the labels are multiplied by alpha t and you add them up you get a number and if that number is more than one then uh, you decide the final decision is also one that number is less than one the final decision is minus one questions If there are no questions, I'm going to put them all together in one slide. And uh, as I'm going through this, I encourage you to think of questions. So the full algorithm looks like this. We are given a training set, and this is the third time we are going to go through this with increasing levels of detail. Um, we are given a training set, x1, y1, x2, y2, till xm, ym. Each xi is some instance in an instance space, and the yi's are minus one or one. We have at our hands also not listed here, we have at our hands also uh, the ability to call a weak learner. The weak learner takes the data set and a distribution over the examples and produces a classifier that respects this distribution. The guarantee that the weak learner comes with is that its error is always better than time. We also have a hyperparameter t, which is uh, the number of rounds that Ada Boost has to run. Given all this, we can start the process. In the beginning, we initialize the weights over the examples to be the uniform distribution. For every example, for the ith example, the weight for that example is 1 over m. Then the Adabus iteration starts. In the teeth iteration, the first thing we do is to find a classifier whose weighted classification error is less than epsilon, it is, uh, is better than chaff. Sorry. So at least it's less than half. In fact, we don't even need to find the best uh, uh, classifier. The, the weak learner does not even need to find the best classifier for that weighted distribution. All it needs to make Adabus function is it needs to find a classifier whose error is better than charm. That's pretty much it at any round. After finding that classifier, you then compute its vote. The vote is alpha t. Alpha t is simply half of uh, 1 minus log of 1 minus epsilon t divided by epsilon t. Here epsilon t is the weighted error of that classifier of the current classifier on the training set. Now that you have the alphas, we can now update the weights so that the next round uh, can, uh, uh, you know, we can get to the next round. The weight updates are designed so that examples that are mistakes are, prom uh, are promoted and examples that are correctly predicted are demoted and the amount that of promotion or demotion is simply e power minus alpha times yi h of xi. So an example where there's a mistake, its weight gets multiplied by e power um, alpha t. An example where there is no mistake, its weight gets multiplied by e power minus alpha t. All these uh, multiplied uh, things are added up, and that uh, that gets you the normalization constant. So now we have dt plus one of i for every example i, and we are ready to proceed to the next round. And this thing goes on for t steps. At the end, after t steps, we have all capital T uh, weak classifiers h1, h2, till h capital T. Every weak classifier also comes with a vote. Alpha t. So now, now basically, these the, these two things are returned. When a new example comes in, we have this final prediction rule, which simply applies these weak classifiers to each example and adds up their weight of uh, uh, the the word, um, according to whether it's uh, plus or minus, and that's the sign of that is the final label. Any questions about this now? Yeah. So if you take a lot of rounds, like a lot of teams are guaranteed by the classifier issue. Actually, what you what we will see when we see the statement of the theorem is that uh, there is a exponential is the the training error drops exponentially with the number of rounds. So it can very quickly kind of get to practically zero. 
So it does not necessarily take a lot of rocks. Yeah. It actually does tend to overfit the training data because if your training error goes down to zero, that means that you are overfitting the training data. Any learning algorithm you take, you wrap it inside this adder boost and you'll get an overfitter. Yeah. Except it comes with some interesting guarantees, which, uh, which is the, the fun thing to think about. It also comes with interesting empirical behavior, and I'll, we'll discuss that uh, later. Did someone else have a question? I thought I saw a hand. No. Okay. Uh, going back to this toy example, this is, again, just to kind of uh, give, tell you what this looks like. This is the final hypothesis. Every H1, H2, and H3 are three different classifiers. Every one of them came with a weight, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3. And let's say you have a new example, let's say somewhere here. Now, H1 predicts minus 1. This example is here. So and let's say here, H2 predicts plus 1, and H3 predicts minus 1. So the final label is sine of minus alpha 1 plus alpha 2 minus alpha 3 whatever those alpha were, which I did not bother to put on the slide. What is interesting is even though the all the weak learners, all the weak classifiers were either axis, vertical or horizontal lines, they were axis parallel lines, it turns out that the combined classifier, the sign, actually is neither a vertical line nor a horizontal line. It's going to look, it's going to have this decision boundary that is not in the hypothesis space of the weak learners. You're building an ensemble, and by the, by building that on, ensemble, you're actually kind of growing the uh, the uh, hypothesis space that Adaboost is searching over. So we get we essentially can the, otherwise you can't this data the or the data that we have on this on this uh, in this box cannot be separated by any axis parallel line. There is no single axis parallel line that can perfectly separate this data. And yet, the combined one can because it turns out that it, find, it actually um, constructs a decision boundary that can lie outside the hypothesis space of the weak learner. Questions? Yeah. Uh, now the, the the question was: Can an ensemble of weak learners always shatter any, any set of points? Um, the answer is: As the ensemble gets larger and larger, the answer is yes. There is some size at which point it will. Which another way of thinking about this, another way to answer the same question is: The VC dimension of an ensemble can get arbitrarily large. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, oh, there are also questions on uh, Zoom, but let's go through your question first. So, the question was um, How do we know what's a weak learner? Is there some sort of a threshold for the error so that this learner gets decided, uh, called a weak learner? The answer is not, not really, but. Uh, it goes back to the point that uh, came up earlier. Imagine that you have a strong classifier. That one classifier will get perfect accuracy on this training data. As a result, it will essentially get an error of zero. And it gets all the importance when the final uh, um, model gets well, in this edge final. So it, does, it, it kind of self-corrects. And there is a sort of an easy sanity check, which is, as the number of rounds increases, if your weighted error goes to zero, it's, there's no point in continuing because no other classifier can beat that one model that you have. It's neither a hyperparameter. It's not a hyperparameter, really, because it's a property of the data. So it's a property of the data and the model. It's like your margin, for example. It's not really something that we can tell upfront what 
uh, we don't know what uh, uh, this particular data set and this particular weak learner, uh, what gamma it gives you. Right, so we can't, it's, it's this sort of a theoretical object. The question on, first question on Zoom, so uh, is, is boosting increasing the VC dimension of weak learners? Yes, it is. In fact, as boosting rounds increases, the VC dimension keeps increasing. And that could be a good thing or a bad thing. And, uh, you know, we have to think about that. The second question is, in this example, we have multiple uh, linear classifiers, but could you use any classifier in its place? And the answer is yes. In fact, a popular um, uh, sort of a weak learner that gets used with boosting is decision stumps. Boosted decision stumps are a thing. Uh, decision stumps, just to remind you, are decision trees of depth one. So you you run your ID3 algorithm, you kind of reorganize the entropy so that uh, the, the distribution D gets incorporated. So examples that are more important feature more prominently in that entropy. And uh, you train decision trees of depth one. These are decision stumps. And those become your weak learners and uh, you can then boost them. And it turns out for certain types of data sets, uh, boosted decision stumps are really, really good. Um, uh, we, we are in 2023 now. So this is the era of large neural networks uh, that have caught popular imagination. But in around 20, 2005, 2006-ish, this was a thing to do. Search engines were basically running boosted decision stumps. Um, it was considered as the best general purpose learner that you could use simply because there is not much thinking to, uh, you just, you have this black box that you just throw at a data set and you'll get something that's reasonable. Um, now maybe we can train neural networks that can do probably as good as, or even better than that, but it is still a good, uh, very easy to implement. You don't need a massive GPU, uh, super easy to implement and very uh, useful sort of tool in your toolkit. Um, in fact, you could also think about implementing it for your project if you want. Okay. What's a learning algorithm without a theorem? So here's one theorem for add a boost. Um, this is the kind of a fun theorem. Let's say you run add a boost for T rounds. And let's say that at any step, epsilon t uh, is half minus gamma t. So gamma t is just half minus epsilon t. Such that gamma t is always less than gamma. That's the, the bound on how bad, uh, how the, the, the weak learner thinks. Then the theorem says the training error of the H final behaves, it, it is going to be less than e power minus two gamma square times cap t. This is all in the exponent. Another way of saying this is that suppose we have a weak learner where we have a, a, the error at any point is equal to half minus some small number. That small number is going to be smaller than all those small numbers or all those rounds is going to be, let's say, smaller than some gamma. The theorem says as the number of rounds increases, the training error drops exponentially. And, uh, you know, the training error has to be, uh, you know, it, it cannot get arbitrarily small because you only have a finite data set. So eventually the training error will go down to zero. This, the proof for this theorem is actually pretty simple. It is a little involved. It's a bit detailed, which is why I'm not presenting it here because it's kind of boring to see a uh, detailed proof in class. But it, it just consists of simple things. And it's also very clever because um, if you look at the proof and then you think about why all these strange looking choices in Adabus came up, they are very tightly coupled, as I said earlier. And it also makes you, or at least it makes me think about how smart, how clever uh, the inventors of this algorithm might have been to invent just these right pieces so that everything falls into place so that you have this result. Um, you can prove this result. So I strongly encourage you to go over the proof. Um, uh, it's worth doing. But something to think about. Is it enough to just bound the training error? 
Is it okay? Is this a sufficient proof? Is this sufficient? What's going on here? Is it enough to just say that the training error will go down to zero? You're nodding your head. Do uh, you want to say something or? The important part is, of course, the generalization error. So all we have here is the training error. So what can, why is this, you know, why am I claiming that this is so clever? The reason is we know that the generalization error is less than training error plus some thing that is uh, depending on the VC dimension. The VC dimension keeps going up as the number of rounds increases, but this quantity can get bounded possibly, depending on other uh, factors here. In practice, what happens is, as the number of uh, uh, the number of weak learners, the, the weak classifiers that we accumulate um, gets more and more, the training error goes to zero very quickly it, because it's exponentially dropping. So we can ask, what about the test error? Well, before that, we can also ask, what about any one of those weak classifiers? Turns out, in practice, as those as the number of rounds increases, the error of the teeth weak classifier seems to get worse because we are fitting all these little bits of noise in the uh, data. Uh, you know, the the last model is uh, going to fit an ex examples that are that were misclassified all the time. So maybe that was nice, and maybe it is not a great idea to fit those examples. As a result, those individual weak classifiers tend to Tend to get not so great, uh, you know, not, tend not to be great. The question, of course, is what about test error? The theory tells us that the training error will keep decreasing, and uh, um, all we can say is uh, it, it, it exponentially goes down. The test error after some rounds might actually go up because the training error has gone down to zero somewhere here, but the VC dimension keeps increasing, so generalization error might. Uh, go up. So there's, uh, you know, there's the question of Occam's razor and overfitting, and all those ideas keep uh, come back again. So it's not like we've solved everything, because you know, of course, we've not solved everything. There's no one magic learning algorithm that can uh, work with all data. Uh, you know, it's just not going to work. So the generalization error need not be all that great. In fact, there's something curious happens though. Uh, the generalization error does not go up. Instead, it kind of plateaus out. And this is uh, uh, sometimes it might even decrease after the training error has hit zero. And this is a bit of a curious observation. And there was a, this really neat paper in 1997 that uh, gave that gave one possible explanation for this. I I can point you to this paper if you're interested, and you can read it. So quickly summarizing what Adaboost is. Um, it's super fast, very simple, uh, and there's just one extra hyperparameter, capital T. You can use it with any weak learner. Um, in, in terms of caveat, the performance depends on the choice of your weak learning algorithm and the data set. There's no magic answer. And if uh, if your weak learners are really strong, as the discussion came up, it's possible that your combined ensemble might actually become over complicated and it might overfit. If your weak learners are too weak, it might take many, many rounds because the, it's not really going to just, it's not going to do a good job. So it might lead to underfitting. Uh, I mentioned this example, this uh, empirical result from uh, Rich Karwana uh, uh, in 2006, which showed that uh, boosted decision stumps are a great approach for uh, if you have small number of features. Uh, all right. Uh, I'm going to quickly talk about other ensembles. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah. So, in, if you practice the test accuracy, uh, you know, the arbitrarily small, uh -huh. then why is it that it's a weak, it's a weak pattern, but it requires strong pattern? Okay. So, in if the test, okay. So, the question this is a very good question. If in practice um, the test error can't get arbitrarily small, why is how is this strong learnability? It is strong learnability because uh, of the bound on generalization that we have. 
the uh, the remember the this thing that I wrote a few slides back. Generalization error is the, the this thing at the bottom. This expression here essentially guarantees strong path learnability. And if the training error goes to arbitrarily small and the VC VC dimension is only polynomial and there's like a lot of detail I'm skipping here, then we get strong path learnability. Strong path the, the gap between these two can get pretty small. There's yeah, of course I'm skipping some detail, but it turns out it is true. Yes. Okay. Um, we have five minutes left. Of course, I'm not going to start support vector machines, but maybe that's enough time for me to talk about other ensemble methods. Now that you are already kind of primed to thinking about building classifiers that contain other classifiers in them and producing consensus. I want to talk about three uh, uh, types of ensembles. Uh, we already mentioned boosting, so I'm going to skip that part. I'll talk about bagging and random forest. In general, ensembling is this uh, meta algorithm that combines the outputs of multiple classifiers, and they tend to be empirically quite robust. Uh, in 2009, Netflix had a challenge uh, where they asked people to predict movie ratings better than they could, and the winning team, the name of the winning team was the ensembles. It was an ensemble of ensembles, it turns out, actually. Uh, they got a million bucks, but they had so many teams that kind of grouped together, I don't know how much any one person got there. Um, but yeah, um, we talked about boosting, so I'll just uh, skip this a uh, uh, little bit and talk about bagging instead. Bagging is short for bootstrap aggregating. It's uh, an idea that goes back to Leo Bryman from 1994. Such a simple idea. Suppose you have a training set with M examples. You repeat a process multiple times. At each step, you draw a certain number of samples with replacement from the training data. Drawing with replacement means you pick an example, put it in your collection, uh, and then you that example can get picked up again. So you draw samples with replacement to construct a bootstrap. It's, it's called a bootstrap uh, sample. You construct a bootstrap sample. You have a data set. You train a classifier. You do this many times. You get many classifiers. The final classifier is simply uh, one that takes votes from all these uh, models that you build. Uh, every model gets to vote, yes or no, and the majority label wins. That's pretty much it. You can implement this now. Uh, you know, it's, it's given uh, your uh, what the code that you already have, you can actually implement bagging over perceptron. You can do bagging over random trees, uh, sorry, uh, decision trees, and so on. Uh, in practice, it's uh, you can do this for regression also. For regression, when you have this ensemble, instead of taking the major most common number, you take the numerical average. This tends to be very robust. It tends to have like uh, good, it produces good uh, estimate, uh, you know, it, it produces stable models and it's a very, very good strategy when you are deploying models. Uh, these multiple versions that we are constructing are constructed from what are called bootstrap replicates of the training data. Bootstrap replicates of a training data is just a fancy way of saying I construct a uh, a set of examples by drawing from the training set with replacement. Uh, turns out that uh, with both for, cla for classification trees, classification with decision trees, and also with regression trees, there's something that we didn't cover. Um, bagging can actually improve accuracy quite a bit because it is it improves robustness and it makes the models more stable. Um, well, you just collect you for decision trees. It's very simple. You draw a collection of bootstrap samples from the data. You train a bunch of trees, and you take the average prediction or the most common prediction, depending on whether you have regression or classification. Super simple idea. You now have like a whole bunch of new things you can try for your project because you can do bootstrapping. So, uh, you can do bagging over decision trees. You can do bagging over all the kind of models that you have. Random forest is basically bagging plus plus if you want. Um, thing. You draw bootstrap uh, you replicate of the data. You construct the bootstrap sample. For each step, instead of just training the model on that, uh, on the data, you also take a random subset of the feature. And then you get a tree. It's called random forest because it's usually done with decision trees. You take a 
you take a bootstrap replicate of the data set, you take a random subset of the features, you construct a tree, you do that thousands of times, you get a thousand trees, take their, uh, the consensus label becomes the final answer. That's pretty much the entirety of random forest. Uh, you know, given that we've already encountered decision trees and all that stuff, random forest is such a simple idea. Take a random set of, you, you take a random sample from the training set with replacement. You take a random subset of the features, train a model, do this thousands of times. And the final label is the most common label for classification among these thousands of trees that you built or the average label uh, if you have the regression problem. Okay, I'll wrap up. We are out of time. So I'll quickly, uh, uh, we talked about boosting and ensemble. Boosting answers this question of uh, the strong learnability imply weak learnability. We went over Adaboost in quite a bit of detail. Ensembles are a fantastic tool to have in your toolkit. So I strongly encourage you to kind of think about using one of those for your projects because it's kind of fun to see if it actually helps. All right, I'll stop. I'll see you all on Tuesday.